Good morning, ladies. Good morning, ladies. Hi. Do I need a little volume, maybe? How about that? Is that better? Can you hear me? No. I'm talking really loud. There we go. That's better. Good morning. Come on in and grab a seat. Good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Good. Um, so last Sunday, Dave shared and he talked about how our words are, have dramatic power in our relationships. Um, and the power to destroy and the power to bless. Um, and he mentioned that there's a, the, the whole biblical concept of giving a blessing. He wants to do a deeper dive study on it. I'm going to let him do that. But the idea that of a biblical blessing kind of intrigued me this week. And so I wanted to kind of just talk about that a little bit and, and share that I think it's a lost art in our society, isn't it? Just blessing someone. Um, so, but what does it actually mean to give a blessing? So I looked it up, vocabulary.com. Did you even know that existed? I didn't even know what that was. Um, says that blessings have to do with approval and they're almost always used in a religious context. Isn't that interesting? Um, several meanings are the act of praying for divine protection. So you say, may God bless you. Um, or it can mean giving a short prayer of thanks before a meal, like you're giving a blessing. You're asking God to bless the food. Um, or it can be a formal act of approving of something. So you maybe say, you know, I give you my blessing with that. Um, but I also think it can be used to affirm someone or tell them thank you or to praise them. Um, so to give someone a blessing is pretty simple, but why is it so hard for us to do sometimes? Um, why do those words of blessing stick in our minds and they don't come out and flow out of our mouths um, as, easily as, they, as easily as they should? There are some people that are really great at this, um, and you know who those people are in your lives, right? Um, and, but for some of us, we just need to practice this. We need to practice giving blessings, and we need to practice receiving them. Um, so after church on Sunday, my mom texted me and said, can you give me a call? And so I did. I called her right away. And she said, I just want to call and give you a blessing. Um, and honestly, it was the ni nicest thing. I felt so close to her. I felt so loved. Um, so thank you, mom, <laughs> um, for calling me with that. And it's interesting how receiving a blessing, <clears throat> I felt loved, number one, but it also made me want to love her more and to give her more of my time as a blessing to her. Um, but another way that we can bless others is to pray blessings from scripture over someone. And I know some of you pray blessings over your children when they're asleep or you used to. Some of you grandmothers pray blessings for your grandchildren. Um, and that's something we can do in person or it's something we can do um, for them. Uh, just, you know, when we're not with them. But I was thinking that sometimes, you know, people just sort of pop into your head and you have somebody comes to mind. And I was thinking praying a blessing when you don't know what to pray for them can just be just kind of a neat way just to stop and pray a blessing for them. Um, so I found a list, and I think it's a great list, actually, of biblical blessings. And so this morning I just thought I would share um, a few of those with you. Um, I think these are good to have handy. Um, I have now have a note in my phone um, with all of these blessings in them, in there. And so if you want a copy of that, I can shoot a text to you and send you that copy um, <clears throat> of these blessings. But I just thought um, this would be a neat way to kind of start our morning. So sit back and listen and be blessed by these blessings that God has for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. It's from Numbers 6. May the Lord answer you when you're in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. That's from Psalm 20. May God be gracious to you and bless you and make his face shine upon you, from Psalm 67. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is so great you will never fully understand it, and may you be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. It's from Ephesians 3. 
May Christ make his home in your heart through faith. Also from Ephesians 3. May you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep God's love is. Also from Ephesians 3. May your love abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. From Philippians 1. May you be strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might, and may you be filled with joy. From Colossians 1. And then from our very own First Thessalonians, may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow. May the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. From Second Thessalonians 3. Let me pray. Thank you, Father, for being a God of blessing. Thank you for blessing us daily with your presence, with your word, with your grace, and with your love. May we be women, God, who bless each other with our words and reflect back the world to the world your love. May you bless this morning, Father, and may we learn how to live in community with each other in a fresh and beautiful way today. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, I, I just, let me just say this, I absolutely love spotlights. I think that's my favorite part of this morning. So we have Bobby Bradley here with us this morning to give us our, her spotlight. Thanks, Bobby. Make sure I don't fall down. No. I have our <laughs> we wouldn't want that. No. Good morning. My name is Bobby Bradley, and I don't know how to work this. Let me see what it, I've been married to that handsome man there for 32 years. That's my husband, Darren. I have two adult daughters, Tiffany and Heather. They're the pride of my life. Um, and between them, they've given me five very active grandsons. <laughs> Those are my boys. So proud of them. Um, we've called, Darren and I have called Grace our home for the last six years. From the very first day I walked in here, I felt so welcome. And I told my husband, this is it. This is a place we belong. Show of hands, lady. How many believe that God is a God of miracles? Mm. I would not be standing before you today if God had not provided me with not only one, but many miracles. In 2015, after a routine day of taking care of my 11-month-old grandson, Nicholas, isn't he a cutie? He's now nine. Um, I suffered a sudden cardiac arrest at home. There was no warning. My heart just stopped. Let me share some of the miracles and the control that God had over my life that day, if my fingers work. I am so thankful that the arrest didn't happen when I was home alone with Nicholas. My husband walked our dog every day uh, before dinner, but the arrest didn't happen while he was out walking the dog. The arrest happened within minutes of him coming home. My husband knew and immediately started CPR and called 911. Their response time was quicker than normal, which, if any of you know, every minute counts. In 2015, there was an 8% chance of survival from a cardiac arrest in the home. Even my cardiologist declares my survival a miracle. God provided miracle upon miracle that day. My family immediately put out requests for prayer via text and social media. People from all over the world were holding my family and I in prayer for weeks. I was placed in a medically induced hypothermic coma 
to lower my body temperature and try to prevent heart and brain damage, I arrested several more times within two days. Somewhere in there is my body on a ventilator. Um, <clears throat> an external pacemaker was used to prevent any further cardiac arrest. My prognosis was grim and my family called in other family members to come to the hospital to say their goodbyes. After a few days, the doctor decided it was time to bring me out of the coma. The coma wasn't doing much, so it wasn't necessary to keep me in there. The neurologist told my family he did not know the extent of the damage done to my brain and body from the numerous cardiac arrest. Again, my family reached out for prayer. Praise God that when I woke up from the coma, I had no issues with long-term memory, speaking, swallowing, or moving my limbs. More answered prayer. I do not have any memory of the arrest or of my time in the coma. I absolutely had no awareness or control over the situation. I believe that was God's intention and his protection over me. My numerous cardiac arrests caused irreparable damage to my heart. A permanent pacemaker with a defibrillator was put in my chest. The device initiates my heartbeat and controls the rhythm of my heart. It will correct any seriously fast rhythms or in the event of a life-threatening event, it will shock my heart. Again, praise God, I've never had to have that shock. I do periodically feel the pacemaker do its job and make the correction. And when I do, I give thanks to God because I know that only he is in control. My heart is totally dependent on this device. I thank God daily for each day he gives me. From this experience, I learned that I can trust God for everything. That just like my heart needs this device for my heart to work, I need Jesus to live. I am saved by Jesus and a pacemaker. One of, one of my favorite um, t-shirts to wear to Bark Park when I walk my dog because it initiates a lot of conversation and space for me to testify. One of my favorite worship songs has always been Hosanna. When it comes to the verse, break my heart for what breaks yours, it has always been the cry of my heart. I choose to believe that God heard my cry and he answered yes. And he literally broke my heart. The doctors have never determined the cause of the arrest, but one of the possible diagnoses listed was broken heart syndrome. Did God really break my heart for what breaks his? I choose to believe he did. For those of you who know me, I cry a lot. I cry in church because of my gratitude to, to God. I heard that. <laughs> I cry and I pray. I don't apologize for my tears because John 11.35 says Jesus wept. That scripture speaks to me of permission to feel and to relate to the sorrows of others and the grief of others, to pray for and with them, to testify to the hope within me and the grace of a loving God. First Peter 13 says, but in your hearts reveal Christ as Lord, always being prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. God has a purpose for my life, no matter my age or the condition of this body. I am forever grateful that he gifted me with a heart broken and dependent on him, full of love and compassion for his children. What an undeserving honor I have been given. Thank you. Father God, oh my gosh, thank you so much for saving Bobby. <laughs> thank you for breaking her heart so that she can proclaim your glory, God. Um, thank you for mending her, for healing her, and for all of the miracles that you have uh, just given to her, God. Um, thank you for what you will continue to do through her 
and with her um, here on this earth, God. Thank you for her just proclaiming your truth today. Thank you for her proclaiming you at the dog park, that you are the savior of her. Um, God, thank you for her life, and thank you for her story. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> wow. Yay, God. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so let's, uh, let's read our passage here together. Um, we're on page 90, and our, our uh, Stephanie will be teaching us today. I'm so excited um, about what it means to be a church family. So 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody repays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Our song this morning is Build Your Kingdom Here by the Rend Collective.
darkness fear Show your mighty hand Heal our streets and land Say your truth Good morning. Ooh, wow, I'm loud. How are we? Hi, church family. Oh, boy. How righty. I think we're there. Okay. Good morning. It's good to see all you ladies. Family. We all come from one. We all got one, for better or worse. For some, family can be a loaded word. It can be messy. History, pop culture, and television has certainly defined or at least poked at our notion of family over the years. There was, of course, the original family, Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel. That worked out well. <laughs> then there was Joseph's family. They certainly had their sibling rivalry issues. If we jump forward in history, we've got Henry VIII's family. I think a few marriage issues going on there. <laughs> to modern times, the Rockefellers, the Hearst, the Kennedys. And then there's our television favorites. Oh, you're m my messing with my little mojo here. We've got Ozzie and Harriet, the Waltons, the Bunkers, the Simpsons. The Bundys, the Sopranos, and of course, the beloved Kardashians. <laughs> Certainly all role models to emulate. But all humor aside, family can evoke profound emotion for each of us. Great joy or deep wounds, a place of belonging or a feeling of abandonment, a source of laughter and happiness, or grief and tears, love or betrayal, gratitude or disappointment. In fact, we cannot help but be shaped by our family of origin, for those were the voices or lack thereof in our early years that shaped our sense of self, our self-worth, our worldview, and the way we interact with each other. So much so that we carry this family imprint whether positive or negative or somewhere in between throughout the whole of our lives, well into our adulthood. Our ability to trust others, work together, forgive, get along, encourage one another, love one another is often hindered or flourishes because of the family we were raised in, the way it was modeled to us. Steeped in, in imperfection because we are so human, good and bad, all of us carry this family imprint to varying degrees. Family. Now, before we delve into today's scripture, I have always found it wonderfully fascinating and so interesting that God did not set us up our primary relationship to be, he's the dictator and we're the minions, or he's the general and we're the subordinates, or he's the boss and we're his underlings. Now, of course, as noted throughout the whole of the Bible and the history of mankind, we know God is the Almighty Creator, the Lord of heaven and earth. He is divine. He is our benevolent King, Holy Sovereign. And we also know we are called to be His foot soldiers, His servants, His followers, His chosen. So yes, there is an unfathomable disparity between who God is and who we are. Don't ever forget that. But in God's grace, mercy, and love, he chose his primary title, his primary relationship with us to be God the Father, making us his children. 
That title, God the Father, Abba, speaks of intimate relationship and inclined posture towards us that feels entirely different than we, if we were just his servants or his foot soldiers. In using the title God the Father within a family context, there is an expectation of intimacy, provision, trust, love, commitment that is unlike any other bond. God is calling us his own. We are his children. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. For all who were led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. Jesus asked, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who does the will of the Father in heaven is my brother sister, and mother. And when Jesus taught us to pray, he said we begin by saying, Our Father. This is our place before God. He is our Father, and we are his kids. And those who share in that common belief, that saving faith, are our brothers and sisters in Christ, our church family. So as we talk about family, today, the church family, I'd like you to shed your worldly notion or your personal experience of your family or your parent-child relationship. Because God is your true father. And any disappointment, pain, grief, or, uh, or loss you may have experienced with your worldly dad or mom or siblings has absolutely no bearing on your relationship with your Heavenly Father and how he views you. Remember God's pursuit of us through the whole of history since the garden. His care, provision, protection, and faithfulness throughout the entirety of the Old Testament, even when his kids were being idiots. And, re and remember his relentless desire to forgive and reconcile us through the life, death, and his son, and resurrection of his son Jesus. That is testament to our father's unfailing love and desire for relationship with us. That is the family imprint, the God imprint we should carry in our hearts. That is the God imprint that should inform our world view, our self-worth, our value, and how we relate to one another. Now, because of who we are in Jesus and his impending return, we need to strongly consider our relationship with one another and how we treat our fellow believers, the family of God. That is today's topic. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 15, ooh, that's interesting, um, Paul says, as he speaks to the church family about the church family, now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Paul is giving the Thessalonians and us a clear outline, a heart posture, a standard of behavior of how we should treat our family, the church family. And I think this is more than a strong suggestion because remember, if God values you and loves you, he also values and loves the person that's sitting to the left of you and the right of you. Therefore, we are called to value one another and love one another as God does. That's the expectation. Now, before we get into the who, what, when, and where, I'm going to start with the why. Why? 
Because if we can't get our minds around the reason, the motivation, the why for how we should treat our church family, then the rest is just moot. We will take today's lesson in four parts. Why we should treat one another with love and high regard. And given that impetus, we should revere and respect our church leaders, live in peace with one another, and commit and care for our church family. So let's get started. Treat one another with love and high regard. Consider your witness. When people want to discredit God and discredit the Christianity, they usually go straight at the church. And let's be honest, we're a pretty easy target. How are you any different than me, asks the world. You don't get along. You have schisms and splits. You aren't faithful, judgmental, prejudicial, and have scandals. You have countless denominations, the Catholics, the Protestants, the Orthodox, the non-denominational churches. You all criticize each other. You are haughty and prideful towards people that aren't like you. You desire success, money, and notoriety as much as me. You are impatient, anxious, and fearful of things beyond your control. So tell me, Christian, how are you any different than me, asks the world. To quote Dave, we as Christians can often use words of religious sentiment. Oh, I'll pray for you. God is with you. I know your brother's just died, but remember, he's in a better place. Well, soothing ourselves, those words can often ring hollow and be hurtful. We offer a, client, a kind platitude and then move on. We are often unwilling to get dirty, jump into the emotional fray, or sit with a grieving friend. Instead, we want to keep an appropriate distance, maintain margin, not get messy. Christian, how are you any different than the world? We believe in God, but we don't necessarily trust him when stuff gets messy in our own lives. Our response to circumstances often reveals our anxiety, our need to control or fix. We get angry or jealous. We meddle and manipulate. And at the end of the day, aren't we often most concerned about our own prayer requests and our own needs being met? So yes, Christian, how are you any different, asks the world. They will know we are Christians by our love. Will they? Consider Christ. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And you shall love one another as I have loved you. In light of what Christ has done for us, and his impending return, Paul is calling us into radical relationship with each other. A call that works against our me-first, prideful, independent selves. It moves us into an integrated, loving, cohesive, Christ-centered community. This call, this way of living, honors God and pleases God. That right there is the main reason we do it. That's the why. When we love one another, it pleases God the Father. It is also, however, what differentiates us from the world. We are called to be image bearers, the reflection of God's love. Our church family and how we interact will be our strongest witness to the world. After all, who would want to join a family that doesn't love, respect, and care for one another? So what does that church family look like? To begin, we are called to revere and respect church leadership. Thanks. There's a whole sermon here, but I just want to hit some high points. I love how one Bible commentary put it. 
Paul encouraged the Thessalonians to acknowledge, appreciate, know the worth of their leaders. And by careful consideration, come to a full understanding of their true character and their diligent labor. We need to recognize those who serve among us. Those whom the Holy Spirit has gifted with spiritual insight, biblical teaching, wise counsel, and good guidance. Our pastors and priests should be trusted and qualified to teach biblical truth and live accordingly. The weight of that responsibility is enormous, as James 3 reminds us that teachers will be judged by a higher standard because they have assumed a greater responsibility. That calling deserves our respect. Our church leaders are also called to admonish you. That old-timey word makes me think of getting into trouble, something about a ruler and knuckles. But admonish is also, instru- is also translated as give instruction. Our leaders are to teach, reprove, instruct, and exhort the word of God. Plainly put, admonishment can come in many ways. If you attend a Christ-centered church, it is likely you will receive admonishment from the Sunday pulpit on the regular. A good sermon, God's truth, will poke at our own sin and our own struggles. Our pastors and priests are called to speak biblical truth, not relative warm fuzzies that make us feel good about ourselves. If you feel uncomfortable, After a Sunday sermon, it probably means Dave or Mark is doing their job. Poking at our idols, our disordered loves, our culture, our acceptable sins. Admonishment can be more specific and personal. If a church leader issues a warning or a rebuke of a fellow believer, the intent is to be preventative or corrective, not shameful or cruel. Hopefully keeping the sin from happening or continuing. Always done in love and humility. On that note, many commentators were quick to point out sorry, that there are no titles listed in Thessalonians. The early church did not have paid pastors or elders boards as we think of today. The early church leadership was simply made up of those Christ followers that were more mature in their faith. I bring that up because there are many leaders among us in this room. You are not on paid staff, but your maturity in the Lord, your faith, your life, your experience, your biblical knowledge renders you worthy of listening to. There is also no way the church can have the pulse of every person in their congregation, the church leadership. They simply can't. So there is a responsibility within the church family to be known, to be vulnerable, and to speak truth into one another's lives. We need to do that for one another. That's why we have small groups and home groups, so that we can come alongside one another. Because our church leaders are called to care for the good of the brothers and sisters, the good of the church, and the glory of God, they deserve our reverence and respect. Live in peace with one another. Verse 13 reminds us we have a God of peace who expects us to live in peace with one another. But we can only do that if we know the peacemaker. Christ did not reconcile us to the Lord and then leave us to fend for ourselves. Christ the peacemaker lives within us. His life modeled how we should treat one another and live among one another. And the closer we grow to Christ, the more likely we will exhibit his qualities. Might I suggest, if your relationships are in turmoil or in constant tumult, rather than try to fix them, go to the peacemaker. Start there. Is your relationship with God broken or wounded? Do you feel forgotten, unseen, Are you mad at him or are you trying to control everything? Have you spent any time with him in prayer and scripture? All of that spews out over our earthly relationships. When I am not right with God, it usually does not go well in the rest of my life. 
my relationships suffer. If you are anxious, covetous, angry, impatient, frustrated with others, are you trusting God with your life and your every detail? If you are calm, humble, joyful, gracious, and at peace with others, I have a feeling you are trusting God with your life in every detail. It matters not your circumstances. It matters if you know the peacemaker. Christ came to bring peace and reconcile us to God. We are then called to bring peace and live reconciled with one another, the family of God. So let's talk about that family, our church family. God calls us to commitment and care for the church family. First, it's important to remember we are not a constituency, a club, a team, or a membership. We don't get to pick and choose who it, who's in and who's out. It's family. It's God's family. So guess what? God chooses and like most family, there's an expectation that it's going to get messy. People will overstep their boundaries, infringe on our time, and exhaust our emotional capital. But it will also be full and rich and wonderful. God is calling us into a relationship with him and into relationship with his kids. Not into hermetically sealed, comfortable lives where we pick and choose who we interface with. Francis Chan would contend, our connection with God depends on our connection with each other. We cannot love God and not love the church family. 1 John 3.10 reads, anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. That's pretty clear. How then do we love our church family? Might I suggest we first set aside our pride? Just as pride can be our biggest obstacle to relationship with Christ, it is also our biggest barrier to a thriving church family. Unlike a college degree, a job promotion, or a starting position on a team, we do not earn merit or work our way into God's favor or God's family. Our relationship is initiated solely and based on God's grace and mercy and Christ's work on the cross. There is no good, better, and best among believers. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Consequently, our posture towards one another should be kind, gracious, welcoming, and above all, humble. When we remember the undeserved grace Christ showered on us, that should impact how we live out our lives and treat the church family. Set aside your pride. Commit to one another. Paul then tells us how to contend with the idle, the disrupted, the disheartened, the weak, the wrongdoer, the struggling brother or sister. But the only way we can know if someone is struggling is we actually have to know them. There is a heart and time investment required to build rela relationship. You got to be committed, willing to be honest, open, transparent, and actually show up. Ask questions. Listen, this family has to be a safe place that fosters trust. We are called to uphold those who are too weak to run the race, those struggling to stand. It will be inconvenient and often require your time, resources, money, and work. But anything worth having typically does. Commit to one another. Practice discernment. Paul goes on to detail a different solution for each struggle. To warn, to encourage, to help, to be patient, to forgive, and to do good. 
We've got to be very careful before we judge someone's actions, talk behind their backs, offer our good advice, or place our expectations on one another. By way of example, two people may be having a really hard time getting out of bed every day. One could be out of laziness, be idle. The other, because they are depressed or discouraged or grieving, the disheartened. The action might outwardly appear to be the same. Someone's not getting out of bed. But the heart condition of each person is very, very different. The point of the church family is to be sensitive to the condition of one another. We can't effectively help or love someone if we don't know the problem, the issue at heart. Only then can we possibly begin to help. It requires a lot of sitting, a lot of listening, a lot of transparency, and a lot of prayer to decipher the self. One may simply need a kick in the butt, and the other may need a shoulder to cry on. Either way, let me be very clear. If there is not love and relationship, there will not be the ears to hear what you have to say. Know one another so you can help one another and be discerning. Encourage. 2 Corinthians 1.4 reads, God comforts us when we are in trials and tribulations so that we may comfort and encourage others as they undergo trials and tribulations. Ladies, let your tears not be wasted. Our hardship, heartache, and loss is hard-earned wisdom, mercy, and grace. It draws us closer to God but also closer to one another. Only those who have truly grieved or struggled or suffered can understand the tender heart of God and truly empathize with the broken. It's why I love the spotlight. I love when someone opens the door to their hardships because it opens the door to conversation when you realize, oh my goodness, you feel that way too. I experience that too. We don't stand alone. Come alongside one another. Be patient. Really, <laughs> with everyone, our impatience with others is often the product of our pride. We are impatient because someone is not adhering to our timeline, our standards, our ways of doing things, our whatever. The humble person understands their own shortcomings, so they are able to set their pride aside and extend grace and patience to others. Imagine if God was as impatient with us as we are with others. Seriously, I would be a pillar of salt in three seconds flat. <laughs> be patient. Forgive. Unforgiveness will kill any relationship. Stupidest movie line ever uttered. Love is never having to say you're sorry. Really? We have seen unforgiveness destroy friendships, families, and marriages. It is something that so many of us hold so tight to. Our pride won't allow us to give it up. We have to be right, justified, and win the argument at all costs. I have been wronged. And rather than forgiving, we plot our vengeance, repaying evil for evil. We play it out in our minds, we revel in it, we feed the hurt. Having no idea 
the deadly damage it is incurring not only to our relationships, but to our very souls. I understand that many of you may have suffered a hurt so deep and a betrayal beyond my own understanding. So forgive me if my words are insensitive. Please. But I do know this truth. If we refuse to forgive someone, we are refusing to do the very thing God did for us. Think about that. Our unwillingness to forgive will in fact become a sin itself. Consider the parable of the unforgiving servant who went to his master and begged that he forgive an unrepayable debt. A billion dollars. And the master in his grace and mercy did. And that same servant, when he left his master, turned to another servant and demanded he pay the tiniest debt to him. When the master heard of that, he was furious. And he had the unforgiving servant arrested and thrown into prison and tortured. Because he did not extend the same grace and mercy. Your lack of forgiveness puts your spiritual condition at risk. It's a big deal. When Jesus taught us to pray, he specifically told us to pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Those are not just words. So I implore you, I implore you, forgive one another as Christ has forgiven you. Do good. Always strive to do good for each other. This can surely be a call to goodness and kindness. And after all, who doesn't love being showered in goodness and kindness? The joy, the laughter, the fun of the church family. But that being said, it is not a pass to do whatever feels good. Sometimes doing good often requires us to do the hard thing. It's everything we've been talking about. Speak truth. That's hard. Set aside your pride. That's hard. Put others first. Serve. Admonish. Warn. Encourage. Be patient. Forgive. That can be hard. And all of these done in humility and love. All of these for the good of the family. In preparing this lesson, it has been so encouraging to me personally, as I have had countless names come to mind, sisters and brothers who have loved me and mine well for a lot, a lot of years. They've showed up for my kids, encouraged my marriage, cared for my brother, helped out when my parents were sick, made flowers for their memorial services, told me to apologize when I've been stupid, <laughs> dried my tears, prayed for my hurts and my hopes for decades. They have shared their lives and let me into their journeys. The church family can be the family you've always hoped for. We are not perfect, but thank goodness our Father is. In closing... I have one last personal remark, my own thoughts. So if you don't agree with me, don't go to Christina and talk to me. <laughs> On the church family. We must remember the church family at large goes well beyond these walls. We know that. I was raised in and still attend a Serbian Orthodox church. Its worship experience is entirely different than grace. The cathedral has beautiful murals on the walls, icons, candles, and incense. There's a lovely choir and a traditional liturgical service. I also love my Sunday worship at Grace as well. The Owens brothers strumming and singing praise to God and Dave's clear, pure teaching. One church 
is not better than the other. For each is rooted in Trinitarian thought, the Apostles' Creed, and is biblically based. Although different, both forms of worship, I believe, honor and bring glory to God. I have often thought what an amazing impact the ecumenical church would have on the world if we stood together as one Christian family. I understand we have different worship preferences and different doctoral ideas, but if we believe in the same God, the same Jesus, the same Holy Spirit, and the same Bible, we are unified in the shared faith and belief in the risen Christ. All those who've experienced the transcendent love of God and the saving grace of Jesus are, in fact, our brothers and sisters in Christ. They're family. They're our family. We all carry God's imprint. We are called to love God and love one another. So imagine this. The unbelievable, far-reaching witness are wonderfully diverse, ecumenical, Christ-loving church family would have if we stood united and worked together as one. Imagine how much that would please our Father. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for the church family. I thank you for the sisters that are here. For all of them have been a source of encouragement and love and joy and support for me personally for many, many decades. I thank you that you allow us to call you Abba, Father, and that you love us so deeply, so intensely that you would give us your only son to forgive us. Thank you for reconciling us. Thank you for making us your children. We love you, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Steph. That was amazing. Uh, I get family. I love looking out and seeing your faces as my sisters. Um, all right, a little loud. Um, thank you, AV Tech people, <laughs> Christina and Julio. Woo! Shout out. Um, thanks so much to Terry Gunlock and Sherry Fenley's group, Sherry F, um, for bringing snack today. It was beautiful. Um, and thank you, Teresa Cairns, for making our coffee today. Where are you? There you are. Um, next week is Yvette, you're on coffee. And Jenny Beasley's group is in charge of our snack. Um, so in two weeks, we have our service day. We had our announcement about that last week. Um, so March 27th, be here in this room and be excited about the ministries that we're going to be serving who are EGM, Teen Leadership Foundation, and Operation Christmas Child. Um, and today we have um, two people that are going to come up, Jamie Mathisrud and Kristen Sanderson. Is she here? Oh, there she is. Good. Um, and they're going to share a little bit about EGM with us this morning. So come on up. Good morning. Um, I'm Jamie. And actually, Kristen's going to do all of the sharing about EGM. I'm just going to kind of remind you of the same things that Gina just said, which is our service day is coming up. But one thing as I was thinking about it is um, we are so blessed every week when we come here. Like, I get so filled by each other. Like, everyone's serving one another in love amazing teaching like we had today, um, even amazing food. And I thought, what a day for us that we get to come together and serve and give after we have been so served and given so much each week when we come. So that's my encouragement that we get to do this together and we get to have conversations with people, maybe not in our small group that we haven't met yet. Um, and our church has been doing this whole thing on like, let's go be grace in action, but we get to actually 
together here be grace in action. And so I am eagerly looking forward to this day. Um, and I think it's going to be super fun. There's two other ministries I'm going to super quickly highlight, but we'll talk more about later. Um, but today we're really spotlighting EGM. Um, the one is Teen Leadership Foundation. And you probably heard last week when Stephanie talked, but Teen Leadership Foundation takes youth, foster youth that have aged out and comes alongside them with the love of Christ to give them very important skills and support that they wouldn't otherwise have. So we'll be creating little um, gift bags of items for them and also little scrapbooks because they actually will be coming back from a retreat so to commemorate their time there. Um, and the other thing we'll be doing is with Operation Christmas Child, and you've heard Diane McArdle speak of that. She loves that ministry. Um, and we'll just be coming alongside that ministry. Last year, they provided 11 million boxes throughout the world to children uh, to celebrate Christmas, but also, of course, with the heart to share Jesus. And so um, those two are important, and we're going to spend time those days. But today, we're now moving on to EGM. Okay, perfect. I'm Kristen Sanderson, and I've had the privilege of serving with EGM for 18 years. And for many of those years, I've been able to participate firsthand in the partnership that Grace and EGM have shared, which has been such a blessing to my life. I've been able to lead several short-term mission trips with members from Grace, be a part of the Christmas Bazaar, um, also share some of our curriculum with the children's ministry. So EGM's partnership with Grace is really special and really important to us as a ministry, but it's also really important to me personally because Grace Fellowship is my home church. So I love that. And this is my first year participating in Abide. And so I'm so thrilled that EGM is one of the focus ministries um, for the Grace Serve Day. So I just want to share a little bit about the ministry. Um, we have 500 leaders who head up our ministry work in the 16 countries where we work. We're going to put up some pictures so you can see their beautiful faces as I talk a little bit more about them. But almost all of them are volunteers. They receive no compensation, and they work tirelessly to share the gospel with children. And God has worked powerfully through these leaders. And just last year alone, they were able to impact the lives of 350,000 children for Christ. But I want you to know that life is not easy for all of these leaders. So in the Democratic Republic of Congo, for example, in the DRC, um, which is known as the rape capital of the world, our leaders there struggle with the unrest, with the violence on a regular basis. And right now, there are rebel groups that have come around um, the city where our leaders live and have blocked everything off. So they're just waiting to see what's going to happen because they are not able to leave where they're currently living. Um, last week, I had a meeting with one of our leaders in the Ukraine, and she sent us a message right before the meeting and said, I'm going to be late because a bomb alert just went off. And what that means is there's Russian planes flying over, and so they give us these alerts because they could drop bombs on us, and we don't know, but they want us to be prepared, so I have to make sure that my children are safe. So in spite of all that's going on and all that these leaders are facing, they are continuing to do the ministry work. And in just the first two quarters of this year alone, our team in the DRC has trained over 800 children's leaders. And our team in Ukraine, and they're based in Kyiv, where it's getting more and more violent by the day, they have actually, in just the first two quarters of this year, they've passed their goal as far as the number of children's leaders that they wanted to train for the entire year. So these leaders love children, want them to come to know Christ, and to learn how to live out um, biblical principles. So for Serve Day, um, for the portion where we're focused on EGM, we get to put together what we're calling blessing bags. They're actually gift bags that we're going to be giving out to all of EGM's leaders, including the leaders in the DRC and Ukraine. And I just want you guys to know 
that they are going to be so encouraged and so affirmed in the work they're doing with children when they receive these bags. Unfortunately, many churches do not value children's ministry, so they don't get a lot of affirmation for what they're doing. So for them to get a gift from a group of Christian women in another country who thinks what they're doing is so important that they would take their time, energy, and money to put together these bags, I'm just going to tell you right now, it's going to mean the world to them. So thank you so much um, for all the contributions that have been made. I just went on our Amazon wish list um, this morning, and that is where the gifts are that we're going to be using to put um, together in these bags for the leaders. And you guys, in just one week, have purchased almost all of them. There's only four gifts left. And then we'll have everything we need to make 500 bags. I know, it's so incredible. So thank you so much, and thank you for participating in this project. Really, it's going to bless these leaders beyond what we can even imagine. Thank you so much. And on that note, if you didn't get to contribute and four of you race out of here and get those items, you can also give through the Grace Giving. Uh, we have a link there, right, Christina? And um, what you can do that way is we can still cover the needs of the other organizations that we're supporting. So it doesn't mean that you've lost the opportunity if the Amazon wish list is met. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And, and actually, since I'm, I happen to be the person that counts the money here at Grace, I happen to know that you guys have given over $6,000. Can you believe? In one week. Unbelievable. So if that's in excess of what we need, which I guarantee it is, um, we will be giving do special donations to those ministries as well. Um, so thank you, guys. I mean, incredible. Um, you've blessed, you will be blessing hundreds of people through your gifts. So, yeah, so we need, f yeah, four items left. There we go. We got one. Okay, here we go. No, I'm, I'm going to be in a little auctioneer. Here we go. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, we have two more, two more. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know what? Thank you so much for this morning. Thank you, Bobby, um, for sharing your heart and Steph for sharing about how we can love each other better. I love it. Um, so go to your groups and love each other well.